Thank you very much, all of you, for having me here today. It's a great pleasure, and I feel very honoured to be sandwiched in between um, Melvin and Hugo. And I suppose, actually, you're completely right. It is. It does make sense that I follow next, because my book is about the American Civil War, and in particular, the British who fought in it. And the reason why I wrote this book is because of my <coughs> lifelong interest in slavery and in the abolition of the slave trade. When I, when I was a student at Oxford, my master's was on the politics behind the abolition of the slave trade. And then I went on to do a PhD, and that was on attitudes to race and colour in the long 18th century. And about halfway through, I was researching the life of Charles Gray, and he was the politician who proposed the motion to abolish the slave trade in 1806. And I suddenly discovered that he had had this incredible mistress, whose letters were utterly extraordinary. That they were so vibrant, they were so moving and, and so intelligent, that she completely changed my understanding of how men and women operated in the 18th century, um, how difficult it was for an incredibly passionate and clever woman to determine her life at that time. And that made me decide that I would stop doing that PhD and instead I'd write a book about her. And that was the Duchess of Devonshire. So um, the thing is, after I, had, after I had finished Georgina, I, I very much wanted to go back and in some way finish what I had started. But it felt like a very, very long and, and it felt a very long way, like a very cold lunch. I, I, didn't, I, I couldn't really face doing it. So I thought, well, what have I learned through Georgina that could steer me into a new project that sort of embraces everything that I've always that I've studied? And then suddenly it hit me, it just hit me in the face. I, I, it, it was right then because when I was at Chatsworth, I realised very early on that I would probably, I, in fact, I knew I would never have the opportunity again to just sit there and spend weeks going through all its archives. So I didn't just read Georgina's letters, I read all the letters of, of her predecessors, and then I went forward and read as far as I could, and I got to the 10th Duke. But while I was researching the 8th Duke, just reading the letters in that era, I discovered that his brother, Lord Frederick Cavendish, who was very sadly brutally murdered, actually, in Dublin, in the famous Phoenix Park murder, um, had gone out to America just before the Civil War, and had come back completely and utterly pro-Northern, and supported the North all during the war, was a great help to Charles Francis Adams, the American ambassador, and also a very good friend to his son, Henry Adams. And, and he, Lord Frederick was such a charming man, he had a terrible lisp, um, and actually had quite a sort of speech defect, so he had problems saying his R's and his THs, and his sus. So you can imagine saying the word abolition of slavery was quite a, <laughs> quite a hardship for him. But even more remarkably than this, while Lord Frederick himself was very pro northern anti slavery, his brother, the 8th Duke, who was then the Marquis of Partington, who was equally anti slavery, um, had, a very, had a very different point of view and a very different experience. Halfway through the war, he, he went out to America to escape his mistress, Skittles because she was very expensive and he couldn't afford to keep her. <laughs> so he went off to avoid her and of course naturally she got on a boat and followed him. Um, so once he realised that she was there, he quickly left New York and went down to Washington DC and, and then fearing that she was going to come after him there, he skipped across the lines into the south, but it was very difficult for her to follow him so he knew he was safe. But while he was in the south, he just became seduced by the southern way of living, by southern gentility, uh, by the southern argument, which was not we are fighting for the right to keep slaves, which they were, but we're fighting for the right to self-determination, we're fighting for freedom, we're fighting for independence. And he became so enamoured of the South that he became a hanger-on to General Robert E. Lee, and actually is recorded as having made an eggnog on Christmas Day in so he was very, he was absolutely in with them, and then when he returned to England and finally broke off 
the Skittles, got a proper job as his father wanted him to. He became the Under Secretary of War in Palmerston's government, and was a, was a um, very vociferous supporter of the South. So he had this tremendous eye of two people, two, two sires of one of the great Whig in our liberal families of England, both liberal in opinions, and liberal in the party sense and yet utterly and completely divided over the Civil War and what it meant between North and South, between different concepts of freedom, different concepts of independence. And I wanted to, and then I realized this is going to be the, the kernel of my next book, to understand, first of all, within one family, how you could have that divergence and what it means to come, come from being a Whig to being a liberal. And then how is it that this country itself, with its very proud anti-slavery tradition could itself become so utterly divided over the meaning of the Civil War, so that by the end of the war, Fleet Street, the theater, university undergraduates, most dons, um, all right on types and fashionable people, were all pro-Southern. And they didn't see that there was a great intellectual disconnection between being pro-Southern and pro-slavery. And so this book is hopefully an investigation and an answer into how that great irony happened. Thank you very much.